It's the middle of June during a heat wave and I'm making my way to the English countryside and I'm going to spend the next 10 days cut off from the outside world. What have I let myself in for? In today's video, I'm going to break down the daily schedule of the 10 day Vipassana course, as well as going into some detail about the impact it's had on me having completed the course now a month later. In a nutshell, Vipassana is a technique that claims to eradicate suffering and it's a wholesome way to make positive contributions to society. Now the goal of Vipassana is total liberation or enlightenment. I found out about the course when I was searching online for meditation retreats and I stumbled upon this website where I saw this offer of 10 days, free accommodation, all meals provided and you're going to learn meditation by experienced instructors and practice this ancient technique originating from India. Thousands of people have taken part in this course, not just in the UK, but also in India and across the world. And I wanted to take part because I was keen on developing my meditation practice and I hoped that this would help me to become more disciplined. In addition, as somebody who has previously taken psychedelic plant medicines for healing and personal growth and used hypnosis to overcome addiction, I wanted to experiment with this altered state of consciousness to develop further through introspection. I'm not going to lie, I'm actually nervous because my inner critic is telling me that this is just going to be another thing that you take part in and you decide that just doesn't work for you and you just quit while you're ahead. Nonetheless, First hurdle over, I make it on time. So I get to Hereford Station and give the centre a call as instructed and I'm told to head to a bus stop where I would then be picked up by one of the centre volunteers. Now I'm advised not to walk from the bus stop to the centre because there's a very narrow country road. Also there's a risk of getting lost and getting shot by a farmer who's never seen a brown face before. While at the bus stop, I meet someone else who's also heading to the same course. A gentleman who's in his 60s and this is not his first rodeo. He in actual fact has taken part in a similar course in Southeast Asia where he spent 10 days and he said it was one of the best things that he's done in a long time. So at this point, I'm pretty excited to be getting onto this course. And there happens to be another person who's also on the bus heading there. So all three of us get off at the stop that we're instructed to and then we wait for this volunteer to turn up. Now this lady who I forget where she's from, originally from somewhere in Europe but is now living in the UK, has come for her first meditation course and she's only 20 something. So hats off to her for trying something so challenging at such a young age. So after a few minutes, this white car pulls up and we're not too sure if this is the person or not who's supposed to pick us up. So we're driving down this narrow country road and my horror movie mind gets activated at writing this whole plot where we're picked up by a serial killer who's posing as a centre volunteer and thankfully we arrive. And on first impressions, the place is pretty. This is one of two centres in England as we head inside, we're then led to a dining room where we fill out a registration form which asks us questions about our mental state, if we've taken any drugs or if we intend to take drugs and most importantly if we commit to the five precepts of Vipassana meditation. Now these precepts I believe have their origins in Buddhism and they are no killing, no stealing, no sex, no lying, no intoxicants. Five precepts which you have to adhere to throughout the course. So I sign my life away for the next 10 days and I head off into the unknown as I'm given a room number to go and put my stuff in and also this pamphlet which I think I read about 50 times during the whole course. There's actually I think four or five different blocks where the attendees will sleep for the next 10 nights. I had, I think anyway, probably one of the best rooms because we had the view of the countryside and I'm telling you it was glorious. I don't think the footage does it justice but this view would be my saviour in the times where I felt like I was going out of my mind 
and I just needed some stimulus. I could sit there literally for an hour and just stare out the window and be quite content. Now the guy who I had traveled up with was lucky enough to get his own room, but I had to share. But when I met my roommate, it was all good because he seemed like a lovely guy. He was from Turkey and he had come specifically all the way for this Vipassana course. So then I head down to the dining hall where I have a conversation with a few other people and we have a lovely meal of lentils or dal with some bread. We are then given an induction by a center manager and after her talk we're to take a vow of silence. This means no communication whatsoever with anyone who's taking part in the course, with anyone from the outside world, orally, in writing or any other gesturing, physical communication, it's not allowed. So we're also asked to lock our mobile phones away and we're given a key that we keep with us at all times. Somebody actually asked a very interesting question, which is, does the coffee contain caffeine? To which the center manager replies, yes. And the person asking the question says, well, isn't that a drug? And I'm guessing that obviously a cup of coffee and tea is not going to do any harm in comparison to smoking, drinking, taking drugs, which I had no plans to do. But the reason I bring this up is that over the next 10 days, I started to find ways of trying to knock the course down and trying to find excuses or reasons as to why I shouldn't invest my time into following it by the T. I'm being pulled out of my comfort zone and I'm trying out a lot of things that I just have not done before. I've never meditated for more than half an hour. I've never meditated for 10 and a half hours. I've never not been without my phone for 10 days. I've never not spoken for over 10 days. So there were a lot of new things that were open to this scrutiny. And I think that coffee point became almost like a validation for me to say, well, okay, if they're flexible on this, then maybe they're going to be okay with me sleeping in for a few minutes. So then the center is split into a male side and a female side by a huge divider down the dining hall. And we have separate entrances and exits to the dining hall and also to our sleeping quarters, as well as showering and toilet facilities. They're all separate. And it's only the meditation hall that we share, but again, men stay on one side, women stay on the other side. It's to do predominantly with sexual desires. Now, how this works for queer people, I'm not so sure. After the induction, we have a little bit more free time, and then we head off into the meditation hall, where we're to take part in our first meditation, following a discourse by Goenka, who introduces the Vipassana course. Now Goenka is somebody who created the Vipassana course. He didn't create Vipassana meditation, brought it back to India after he had experienced a retreat that he had gone on because he was suffering from migraines and apparently the migraines were incurable by Western medicine. So when he went on the meditation course, he found that his migraines had completely disappeared after he started to practice Vipassana meditation. Goenka is a multi-millionaire. He's somebody who could afford the best doctors in the world. And apparently it was Vipassana meditation that was able to heal him and allow him to live a more happier life because he wasn't suffering from the pain of these migraines. After the first discourse or the opening meditation, we head off to our quarters and head to sleep. The next 10 days, we follow this timetable. So every morning we're woken up at 4 a.m. with a bell. It's a person going round from block to block. It wasn't that loud, so I did sometimes sleep through it. However, I did have an alarm as well on my watch, so I was able to still wake up. I had actually spent the last two months preparing for this because I've never really been a morning person, only in the last few five to six months have I started to build my routine and that involves getting up early the same time every day. Once you're awake the intention is to prepare yourself for the first meditation of the day so you have around 30 minutes or so to go and 
brush your teeth, go for a number two, whatever you need to do before you're ready to meditate. Now from 4.30 to 6.30 a.m. we would go into the meditation hall every morning or you could choose to stay in your room and meditate for two solid hours. Now prior to this I had only been able to meditate up to around 30 minutes each day for whatever reason because I just would never push myself beyond that. And prior to even that 30 minutes I had started off at five minutes around two or three months ago and I did feel like I was progressing to a point where I had become more invested in the meditation. I was able to sit through it without my mind trying to count the minutes or going off onto tangents, thinking about things, thinking about my day, thinking about the past, whatever it might be. I was able to kind of ground myself into the present and I was finding days where I would be able to meditate and it would really help me out and I would feel like once I'd meditated 30 minutes, I would feel like this level of accomplishment. The first day, I managed to soldier in, sat down in the meditation hall, grabbed a few cushions. Well, in fact, probably about 10 or 15 cushions and I had stacked them up. And I just sat there and I was able to get into my zone. As instructed, we were to focus on our breath. So as I was focusing on the breath, I was sitting there, 15, 20 minutes would pass. And then I would get a little bit, impatient and I would look at my watch. Sitting in the hall was uncomfortable at times, I'll be honest with you, because you're sitting in a room full of other people and you can hear other people breathing, other people coughing, sneezing, farting, burping, whatever. It can be distracting and the point of it was is that it was intentional for people to sit in the hall because you're supposed to train yourself to not be pulled into these distractions and be able to focus on yourself as much as possible. So in a way, you are kind of being thrown into the deep end here. A hardcore two hours straight away, 4.30 in the morning. Now, anapana is the technique of focus as much as you can on your natural breathing. And it's important that you don't try and manipulate your breathing as such. But every time I would focus on my breathing, I found that like I was deep breathing or what I was doing, I was elongating my breath or I was not leaving a gap between my breath. And the reason being was because every time there was a, a gap in my breath, my voice would start. And it was just impossible to turn the volume down on that point because it would just like even between the breath it was just like the voice was just like oozing through and it would just would not stop so the breath work for me what I was doing was manipulating my breath in a way where I was able to just just stop stop that voice completely from even just penetrating my mind and to just have some distance from that that negative inner dialogue was just bliss and as the day would progress small things would become monumental and focusing on the breath really helped to just forget about it. So Anapana was the foundation of the technique. It took me a while to to pick this up and I'm guessing this is probably consistent for many others on the course hence it is 10 days and there's not much variety in terms of the meditation that you do do. So I was kind of finding myself becoming agitated with this because we did it for the first few days. It's just focusing on the breath and that's it. Focus on this area above the upper lip. Focus on the sensation of the breath going in through your nose and out through your nose. You don't use your mouth at all. Now I've got hay fever. So for me, even after taking a Puritan tablet, I was dripping in snot and tears and each morning I was just bunged up so trying to breathe through my nose was a challenge. Now luckily for me I had packed this peppermint stick that I was carrying around with me and I would put a little bit on my hand and I would rub it between my palms of my hands and go and inhale it and it would just allow me to decongest. Trying not to sneeze as well because I didn't want to disturb other people. I'm trying to be mindful of me making noise and breaking other people out of their meditation as well. However, Goenka later explained in his discourse 
the benefit of doing the meditation in the hall in the group is that it teaches you to be respectful of others and also to be mindful of the condition of someone else so if someone's sneezing they're not doing it intentionally you can be offering some loving kindness to them in actual fact in a way you you offer them compassion for what they're going through now the other challenge was negative thinking could i could not believe how much negativity was just circulating in my mind all the time autopilot negative thoughts negative thoughts and it became magnified because you're spending time in a place where there's no distractions there's nothing you can escape into i can't watch tv i can't read a book i can't go on social media i can't speak to my friends i can't listen to music distractions that i would use sometimes to get away from negative thinking and would help me to escape just falling into a downward spiral and beating myself up over things and what not that was a huge challenge was to go through the 10 days and having this negative feedback loop just constantly in my mind and just being there and the more i would think about it the more i would try and stop it the more it would persist what you resist persists as they say because i knew that that negative thought had nothing interesting to add to my day aside from just being an annoyance so in a way i was almost able to deflect from it and just let it just fizzle out so when i focused on my breathing it just automatically just did not give me scope to think of anything else other than the breathing so i became quite good at doing that and that was one of the benefits that i actually continued to use after throughout the day to day and it's not something they necessarily tell you to do in the course but it was something that i felt i could use and adapt for my own use because i found it particularly useful and even during the meditation it was uh, sometimes when i just found that i kind of was just telling myself what am i doing here this is so boring i don't want to be here and then the breathing would just help me to just soothe the mind calm the mind get back to just focusing on the technique so from 6:30 to 8 a.m. we have the breakfast break and there was a good choice we had cereals three different cereals or four different cereals there was white bread there was brown bread there's two pieces of fruit you can pick you can also have crackers with jam marmalade tahini and also tea and coffee was served as well and it's self service so you line up and then you just go with your beggar's bowl as it's called and you just help yourself to whatever you want so from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. is the group meditation in the hall this is one of three meditations one hour meditations that you do in the hall each day as a group now spoiler alert the vipassana technique coming up so if you don't want to hear exactly how it's done just skip forward to the next chapter so essentially what vipassana is is focusing your attention to parts of your body starting with the top of your head all the way down to your feet and then back up again and then as you progress with the technique you can start going inside your body and outside your body and penetrating each organ and just going in and out and just really focusing your attention on the parts and sensations throughout your body coming to the course i was able to see why it takes 10 days at least for you to to build the discipline it was boring at times just focusing parts of the body because i i'm all, i've always been somebody who wants to feel like i'm achieving something like i want to feel like there's a reward i'm getting something out of it and as someone who's done a lot of psychedelics in the past i have been able to go into dimensions i was able to experience sensations in my body i would know that there was always going to be something that i would get out of each time i would take the psychedelic there was always going to be a sensation there however with the meditation there's times where you just don't feel anything and the intention is that you're not supposed to be looking for at, for anything in particular and in fact there's no right or wrong sensation a sensation could be anything from a itch to a throb 
to some warmness, to some coldness, to some ache, to some pain, to nothing. And the most important aspect of this technique is equanimity. Now this means to objectively observe the sensations that are happening in your body. And you observe if it's good, you observe if it's bad, and you also observe if there's nothing there. And I was spending one minute going from head to toe, and I was able to really just focus on any sensation that was happening. And once I would feel something, I would let it be, and I would just move on. Now, it was easier said than done, because there would be times where initially when I was doing it, I was feeling these like tingles that would come up and I thought oh my god I'm feeling all these sensations that that must mean that I'm a master at this technique and no it wasn't in actual fact it was meaning that I was paying too much attention to the pleasure aspect and that wasn't so, that was something that we encouraged not to do in fact we're supposed to just appreciate whatever sensation that we are given and in a, in this case this is what the technique does is that when you're focusing on each section of your body you're looking for a sensation but you're not putting value on it you're not saying that me feeling something here is good me not feeling something is bad the actual fact is is that whatever you feel or you don't feel is just the technique it's just being equanimous you're just observing you just focus you focus on the breath, you focus on the sensations, and that's it. The next two-hour meditation is between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Again, you have the option to meditate in the hall or in your room. So between 11 a.m. and 12 p.m. was lunch break. And honestly, this was my favorite time of the day. Reason being is the food was amazing. There was a choice of vegetarian dishes because I'm not a meat eater, I wasn't missing out on anything. People who maybe eat meat would think otherwise. But I personally really enjoyed the options that they had. On some days, we would have a pudding or a cake or something sweet. Then you could have tea or coffee. There was vinegars, there was salads, there was breads. There was all kinds of things. It was just delicious, delicious food. 10.10 for the food. 12 and 1 p.m. is a bit of free time where you can rest walk the grounds or go and see the teacher with any questions that you might have. Now I would normally spend my time going around the grounds because there's like this whole huge field around the back of the center where you can just walk around and it's like this little forest, a little escape that you can just be in your own zone and just walk around and appreciate the glorious British countryside. And you get to see these little bunny rabbits and all these creatures just living harmoniously in this lovely environment although my hay fever was such a huge problem because we're in the middle of the countryside and it was like pollen nation and i was just in a place of discomfort anybody who has hay fever this is a consideration that it's going to be something that might be pissing you off throughout the day when you're trying to focus on your meditation and the hay fever would be an issue so i went to go and see the teacher about this and the teacher said don't think about it too deeply just try and persist through the technique and just allow yourself to do as much as you can. I also thought that the teachers were kind of, in a way, if I'm being completely honest, a little bit robotic with the technique. It felt like I was asking them questions sometimes and they would just have this kind of default answer and they would not stray from that and they would not tailor their answer to my specific need. And then from 1 p.m. to 2.30 it's the second longer period of meditation where you can meditate in your room or you can meditate in the hall. In these sessions, I would sometimes lie in my bed, which was something that was taught to us not to do because, and I can understand why, because I would drift in and out of consciousness going to sleep. So from 2.30 to 3.30 is the second one hour group meditation of the day. At around day six, we then move on to practicing sittings of strong determination. And what this means is meditating as strictly as you can without moving your body, without adjusting your position. Now you can move a little bit if you know if you need to, or if you do feel like your leg's gonna fall off, then then move your leg. Or if you feel like you need to cough or you need to sneeze, then, then do so. But the idea being ideally is that you don't move your hands, 
if they're, if they're kept in a certain position. You keep your eyes closed and you keep your legs closed. You don't unfold your legs and unfold your arms. And initially, that was super tough because not only are you trying to focus on areas of your body and scan through these areas, you're also finding sensations in your body that you just that are just unpleasant and you just want to adjust and you just don't want to be in pain because you feel like the pain in a way is distracting you from the technique if that makes sense and that's what I was doing was I was focusing sometimes too much on the pain but then when I learned that the pain is temporary it made it so much more easier that I was sitting with a dead leg for a whole hour and it got to a point where I was just seeing it for what it was and it was just a feeling that was there and knowing that it was going to be temporary, I allowed it to be there. I accepted it. I accepted it to be there. And once I accepted it, it just was not a problem. Accepting pain, accepting the temporary nature of things allows it to not be problematic in your life. And it allows you to sit with it, be with it and let it pass. From 3.30 to 5 p.m. is the second one and a half hour meditation where you can go into your room or you can go into the meditation hall. Probably 60% or 70% of the time I was going into my room because I just wanted to be comfortable if I'm being completely honest and I just wanted to be in my own space. My roommate was also somebody who chose to meditate in the room more than in the hall and most of the time we were both lying down and either he was falling asleep or I was falling asleep but I guess the good thing in a way was when I would hear him snore, I would wake up again and I would sit back up and it would just get me back into meditating. Ten and a half hours meditating a day is tough. I don't think I meditated for ten and a half hours solidly each day. Maximum I must have done probably was around eight to nine hours. Having said that, I'm still sitting there. But when I'm saying eight or nine hours, I mean actually absorbed in the technique the rest of the time I might have either been falling asleep or I might have been drifting in and out of daydreaming or procrastinating or just doing something other than practicing the technique someone who was doing 30 minutes or starting off at even five minutes two or three months ago to get to this level I thought I'm doing all right 5 p.m to 6 p.m is the tea break but the tea break is tea and some fruit, two pieces of fruit to be precise. And this isn't too bad because as I said, I had filled my belly knowing that this was going to happen on the rest of the days. So surprisingly, I was not hungry by this point. I was able to get through the day and not really think about food. And another thing I did was pack an emergency supply of snacks in my bag because I'm just a rebellious shit. But I did not succumb to temptation and I managed to sit through the whole 10 days without even touching those snacks. The last group meditation in the hall is between 6 and 7 p.m. Because it was the last one of the day I was finding myself really push and really just give it, give it my all and pretty much most of the days I found that I got to grasp the technique during the last session, during the, that last group meditation I was able to pick up on what was the essence of what we were being taught in the technique and I felt really accomplished as a result of that and it would help me to really have faith in the technique and believe in it and just keep saying to myself you know you can do this especially in the sittings of strong determination the leg was completely dead I felt like I was going to become an amputee because of I was losing blood circulation in my arm and in my leg and I was being overly dramatic about it but then after the first time when I sat through it and I moved my leg and I realized that the pain literally just went in seconds it was wasn't even there and I forgot about it and I allowed that experience to in a way give me the determination that I need to push through the other experiences between the hours of 7 and 8 15 p.m you have the teacher's discourse in the main hall and this is where we're sitting in front of a projector on the wall in front of us and we watch a video from Goenka, who is the founder of the technique and he gives us anecdotes about life, teaches us 
about technique and it's much needed because there are points in the day where you start to doubt yourself, you start to doubt the technique and listening to his lectures gave me the kick up the arse I needed sometimes to just believe in it and get on with it. So the recordings themselves were filmed in the 90s. So this is some 20 odd years later where we as human beings have now become slaves to technology and our attention spans are reportedly a lot shorter. So I was surprised that he was able to hold my attention anyway for as long as he did. And now you're watching this video and there's no cuts in this video. There's no cutaways, there's no B-roll, there's no fancy music. So he delivers his message in a way that resonates with you and it makes you believe that this technique is really the best thing since sliced bread and you have to follow it to a T in order for you to be able to benefit from it. Now, I love the way he presented things and he came across as really genuine in a lot of respects and helpful and motivating. Other aspects, I wasn't as convinced. Now, there was a lot of times where he says, if you don't do this, you're going to be miserable for the rest of your life. You cannot experience enlightenment unless you practice Vipassana pre pretty much every day for the rest of your life. Two hours a day, not many people would actually be able to do this practically. Goenka talks about the technique being scientific. However, I struggle to see how this was the case as he talks a lot about past lives and this concept of sangharas, which want for a better word are basically traumas or blocks that we carry around with us. And some of these may have originated from your past life. And some of them you may have generated in your current life that are still causing you problems and complications. And through the technique of Vipassana, you're able to eliminate these Sangharas and live a more fulfilling life and be on the journey to this concept of enlightenment. Enlightenment is not an easy concept to explain. It's not something that can be boiled down to a few words. In a way, as somebody who's done psychedelics, I felt like I was experiencing what it feels like to be enlightened while I was under the influence of plant medicines, doing ayahuasca, doing bufo, taking mushrooms on LSD. All of these allow you to, in a way, experience a higher consciousness, which is what I imagine is what Goenka talks of when he talks about how Buddha achieved enlightenment and went into this state and was able to achieve these feelings of pure bliss and connectivity with the universe. I was all good with the notion of acceptance and impermanence and equanimity and how you can use that in life and really get over traumas and get over experiences by allowing yourself to feel the pain, sit with the pain. You know, notions of in modern day, this whole notion of self-compassion is built upon that, is to actually be in that situation, feel the situation and allow yourself to soothe yourself and comfort yourself in the same way that you would somebody else who is going through that trauma. There's a lot that he covers. Now, if you imagine it's almost 13 hours or so of lectures and you're not permitted to take notes. So you're just committing to trying to remember these concepts as you're meditating. And then, of course, you can buy books and read the books and then refresh your mind that way. But I found it really challenging is to try and sit through something because it's just not the way I was taught how to learn things, was to just absorb things and be able to process a huge amount of information without any breaks and just be able to take on board these concepts and just accept them for what they are. So I struggled with that somewhat, is not being able to take notes and refreshing what he has taught. So 
Probably 90% of what he talked about, I've forgotten. The videos themselves I've seen recently, they're available on YouTube, so I can link them down below. After the discourse between 8.15 and 9 p.m., most of the time it was around 8.30 to 9, it was a half an hour meditation. That's the final meditation of the day. And then 9 p.m., you head or retire to your bedroom and it's lights out. On day 10, we're allowed to talk. So after the first meditation, we can then communicate with everyone else. And it was great to finally be able to talk at length with my roommate. And it was weird to share a room with someone and not speak to them for 10 days. But speaking to other people, it was interesting to see how they interpreted the technique and what they had experienced. And I know what we're taught is not to compare. Everybody's experience is different. But I think it's just human nature to be curious, to try and understand what others had interpreted. And also, from my point of view, there were questions that the teacher did not answer. So I wanted to ask other people and see what their interpretation was. And the points that I wasn't clear on, other people were actually able to expand on them and it gave me a greater understanding so it was beneficial to talk to them and during day 10 there's less meditating time and just more time to explore the center and also an opportunity to donate now i mentioned before that the course is actually free you don't pay anything up front and you also are not expected to pay anything at the end only donate what you can now, the principle behind this is that whatever you donate pays it forward for new students. So it will cover the new students' accommodation for the 10 nights and their food as well. What I liked about it was there was no pressure from anyone to donate. Nobody came around with a clipboard or a box, money box. They just had someone at a table with a card reader and just said, look, this is your opportunity to donate and they're going to be here from day 10 to day 11, so you can donate at any time you wish. Or if you don't have the funds, you can donate later. Or if you don't want to donate, you just don't donate. Day 10 was probably the best day because it just felt like I was able to get more clarity on things that I didn't really understand and things that the teacher didn't explain. I was able to pick up from other students. And day 11, the course is over. We head off back home and make that journey back to reality and integrate what we've learned. So there you have it. That's the hour by hour schedule broken down and my account of what went down during my 10 days of the Vipassana course. What I took away was patience to be able to spend longer meditating in silence and also without being as agitated or needy for knowing what the time is or getting distracted. I think I developed the brain capacity to be able to sit through a longer session of meditation. Another thing I'm taking away is the aspect of anapana, focusing on breath whenever I'm in a situation when I'm particularly feeling like my mind is cloudy or I'm having some negative internal dialogue, which isn't particularly helpful. I'm able to turn the volume down on that simply by focusing on my breath using the technique of anapana, which I believe is not exclusive to Vipassana. Did I hallucinate or access any higher consciousness states? No. And that was okay because the technique itself never promised that. I had just assumed that was going to happen, judging by what I had heard from a number of people. But it never, at any point, does it actually say that it's going to allow you to reach transcendental dimensions. During my course, I had so many ups and downs. One day I was as high as a kite. The next day I was just feeling so low. For people who have serious mental conditions, it's not advised to come on to something like this because in actual fact, it could make things worse. Now, this is one month after the Vipassana meditation course. Have I been able to keep up with the meditation? No. If you want to stay faithful to the technique, it is advised that you do practice two hours a day and also revisit the Vipassana meditation 
course again at least once a year, the 10 day course at least once a year. I have not been able to keep up with two hours a day. I think I've probably meditated less than what I did coming into the Vipassana course. Prior to this, I was doing at least half an hour a day. After the course, I kind of didn't want to meditate for a long time. I've only managed to do around two or three hours of meditating using the Vipassana technique. Originally, I took part in the Vipassana course to help me to be more motivated, to be more disciplined. And I think in a way actually did the opposite. I started to become less motivated and I meditated a lot less than I did before I attended the course. Now, everyone's experience is different. So if you're going with the intention to become more disciplined, it didn't work for me, but maybe it will work for you. And I can't say, and I'm not going to say that that's going to be the case for everyone. We also had a WhatsApp group, which is something that one of the other attendees created. I actually posed the question to that WhatsApp group as well, and only one person responded and said that they were keeping up to doing two hours a day. Now, according to Goinka, you are not to use any other technique or practice in conjunction with Vipassana meditation because it dilutes its effectiveness. That was one of the reasons why I decided not to continue because I never came to this Vipassana course with the intention to solely do Vipassana because I believe that it's not the be all or end all for everything that I'm going through in life to help me. And also as somebody who has created a YouTube channel with the specific goal of helping people around the world by trying out and testing different techniques and forms of practice to help with overcoming anxiety, self-care, beating depression, just turning any setbacks into success. I don't think there's one technique that could encompass all of that and I didn't want to spend the rest of my life devoting myself to Vipassana meditation. That's just me. Other people might disagree and say you're interpreting it incorrectly but that's what I understood from what I heard in the discourses is that in order for you to benefit from Vipassana, you are to solely pr practice Vipassana and no other techniques for two hours for the rest of your life and attend these same retreats as many times as possible that you can in the year, but at least once a year. Now, this is not to take away anything from the 10-day Vipassana course to say that it's it doesn't work, it's ineffective. I'm just talking about my own experience and what works for me and what doesn't work for me and what worked for me, as I said, was the breathing techniques, was the focusing on the pain and just letting it be and sitting with the pain. But these principles are also principles that are universal in mindfulness. You know, this whole notion of impermanence, this whole notion of equanimity. It's not exclusive to Vipassana meditation. What I didn't really buy into too much was the Sangharas aspect was the notion that you're carrying traumas from your past life and in order for you to get over the pain and misery, you have to meditate to release these sangharas and not meditate in the correct way. And if you don't meditate in the correct way, you're actually creating more sangharas and creating more problems for yourself. So it's actually counterproductive. I prefer to take the viewpoint in life that suffering is a part of the human condition and to eradicate suffering is eradicating a part of you that makes you a human being. And I chose consciously or unconsciously to almost get in my own way of practicing it every day. It's something that I could potentially come back to in years time. But right now, where I'm at in life, when I want to create a YouTube channel, where I'm trying to help as many people by doing as many different techniques and being a vehicle for experimentation. And I still feel like I'm at the beginning of my psychonaut journey. I'm still exploring other states of consciousness. And I'm so interested also in methods like hypnosis, which have proven to work for me in one hour. One hour sessions where I was able to just listen to a recording and give up smoking. That for me was powerful. 
This technique is powerful in a lot of ways, but it takes time. It takes a lot of time. It takes patience. It takes dedication, a lifelong dedication, according to the person who bought the course to the masses. It's something that you have to do for the rest of your life for two hours a day. I just don't have time for that and I just don't have the patience right now. How I'm going to use Vipassana is I'm going to pick and choose the aspects of the technique that worked for me. And I'm grateful to all the staff, all the other participants who shared their stories with me. And for anyone else who wants to open a conversation, please do so in the comments. I'd love to hear from you about your own experiences with Vipassana meditation, or if you're somebody who's starting out, who wants to, who has questions, who wants to find out more, I'm happy to help where I can. Would I go back to a Vipassana meditation retreat? Probably not. As somebody who has done plant medicines and has tried out psychedelics, I understand the bigger picture of life and I know that there's other ways of achieving the things that you can achieve in Vipassana meditation in a way that's not going to take as much time and energy, if I'm being completely honest. You know, I'm a lazy person and I don't want to put in the time and effort. I said it. Now, would I recommend going on the retreat? Yes. I would say if you're somebody who wants to try out a new experience, who is interested in meditation, who wants to improve their focus, who wants to improve on how you relate to the world, how you relate to yourself, then it's a great introduction to that. But even when I was sitting and doing the course, I was thinking, oh, there's so many people that I feel would benefit from this. I'm going to tell this person and that person. And in a way, that's why I created this video as well, because there's so much that you can still pick up and learn from this technique that can be applied to your day-to-day -day life. Thanks for watching this video. I do hope it was insightful for you and gave you some food for thought when it comes to Vipassana meditation. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button and the notification bell to be updated whenever there's a new video on this channel. Take care and be kind to yourself.